Okay, today I would like to start a, um, a, a sort of series talking about Jesus Christ. The month of December is uh, a conventional month. Uh, we write Christmas everywhere, but I would like to write Jesus Christ everywhere in my life, in your life too, in my preaching. And uh, look at this event from a standpoint, uh, from the standpoint of John this morning and the following uh, occasions. I would like to talk about uh, the events of, uh, in, the, in Jesus' life, uh, birth, you know, and, and uh, whatever happens in the Gospels there from a social historical point of view, just to find out how people received these news in, uh, in that time. Probably not necessarily sermons, but occasions to talk about it and learn a little bit more about that time. Uh, today I would like to introduce this with a message that uh, speaks to me and uh, reassures me of the, of the promise given in Jesus Christ that we have life and life abundantly in Him. Let's have a word of prayer and analyze this passage today. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity we have to be together in your name and open the word of life. Please speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, what I find about uh, the, word, the word of life is that it speaks relevantly in every period in history, every epoch, every, every time, every, every uh, movement that takes place in this world can be addressed by opening this word and uh, this word gives the solution for every specific question along the history. Um, no matter when we live, if people lived in the first century and they had some questions there, the word of life answered the questions. And not only that the word of life answers the question, but the, the word of life is the only answer to the questions. That's my point. And then in the Middle Ages, also people had concerns the word of life came with a very relevant message. In the 21st century today, we have a concern. We'll see in a moment. It is only the word of life that gives us the answer. Um, I would like to read this passage again in uh, 1 John chapter 1, the first four, uh, four verses. That which was from the beginning... These are the words of, the, of John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our, uh, our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Uh, my question for you today. How many of you, when you experience joy, that joy is complete? We do experience joy in this life. No question about it. The question is, how many of you have felt that you experienced joy in the complete form, not just partial, complete joy? Let me rephrase the question. How many of us live life complete, abundantly, to the full, not just partial, life in its fullness? How many? The thing is, nobody can live life to the full. That's the thing. That's the, 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 that's the truth that nobody can uh, question. We do have joy. We do experience joy. We do live the life. We have the thrills of life. However, nowhere you can find someone who can say, my joy is complete. My life is complete. There is always, always a space there that cannot be filled. 
or can be filled, but, but it's very hard to find that liquid that fills the, the, the space. Um, John here says something very interesting. He says that the life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. My friends, what John is saying here is that eternal life is not that sort of life that we live, but is endeth, endless, you know? Uh, when he speaks about the life appeared, he's not talking about life. He's talking about life. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? When he says the life appeared, that makes the difference. Uh, we think we live the life, but when he comes and says the life appeared, we see life afresh, anew. Oh, that is life. I know now. I thought I lived my life, or I, I thought I, I lived my life to the full. I can only see it now when it appeared. Uh, Imagine life as you live it right now, that will go endlessly. S cycles of life as you live it now, not different, just now. But you discover that you do not die, never. You, you live endlessly. How would you feel? The life that we live now. Someone comes and says, good news, nobody dies anymore. Everybody lives forever, life. How would you feel after 2,000 years, they say? You would like to die, right? Tired. Tired. Yeah. When, when John speaks about eternal life, my friends, he's not talking about life that never ends. He talks about life complete. And when he says in verse 2, the life appeared, of course we know he talks about what? About Jesus Christ. When he says the life appeared, he talks about what John mentions in his gospel in chapter 10, that he came to offer us what? Life, and what kind of life? Abundantly. Life that, that is not easy to find, but once you understand, you discover Jesus Christ, then you can finally know what life abundantly is. You can die, but at the resurrection, you already have started to live your life abundantly in Jesus Christ. Um, I have a question for you, another question. What do you think stands between us and life complete, life abundant, life to the full? What, what, does, what, what is in there, in between us, that, that prevents us to touch it and really live it to the full? Sin. Uh, we had a series not long ago, Life Abundantly. And I mentioned one Friday night that, un that until sin uh, is a problem resolved or solved, we cannot live. And the only one who forgives sin is Jesus Christ. So sin is definitely uh, one answer. But... What else? Sin looks, looks too philosophical for many people who do not come in touch with the word of life too often. Let's just speak, uh, uh, let's use our human words now. Sin is a word that is, has a very deep, you know, um, profound uh, uh, flavor about it. Anyways, what stands between us and life complete? I'd like to mention the three fundamental anxieties of people anywhere, everywhere in history that stand be between us and life complete. And you would agree with me. This is not only what the Bible says, but people have discovered and they know this is a reality. Death. We die. We die. And that stands between us and life complete. That's one thing that stands between us and life complete. Number two, guilt. We have a sense of, of guilt 
that drains our energies every day of our lives. Do not, the, the guilt that doesn't let us to live life to the full. Probably today you don't feel guilt. Tomorrow you'll definitely feel it. The day after tomorrow. Guilt always in between us and living life complete. And there is another, another anxiety that I'm, I'm going to mention at the very end of my presentation today. Let me, <clears throat> let me uh, just rephrase what John says here. When he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. When he says this, he actually proclaims one thing. He says, Jesus is the only solution to the problems that we, I mentioned already, two of them. There is one third, that, a third of, uh, problem that I'll mention at the end. But he is the only solution. Whether you want to accept it or not, whether you are religious or not, whether you care about the religious um, speech and proclamation or not, John says that Jesus is the only solution to those problems. Uh, people today are very skeptical about this. This is a language that they hear over and over again, and they don't understand how, how is that possible. Uh, John says here, Jesus is the only solution to the problem. My friends, I mentioned that um, not only the Bible mentions about about the, the, the barriers that stand between us and life complete. But people discovered along the uh, years, you know, that uh, in psychology, psychiatry, those who understand the, how the brain function and so on and so forth, they know that we all, human beings, we have a problem. The problem is that this problem is not pathological. It's not an illness. But it is like an illness. And this problem is, uh, let me give you an illustration. Imagine that, that all of us would be blind. All of us, blind. Would that be a problem? No, that would be natural. All of us are blind. If three of us are blind, the rest can see. That is a problem, right? But imagine that all of us are blind that becomes natural. Is that a problem or not? It is not a problem, however, we cannot see. You understand? People studying life have understood that we all have a problem. It's not an illness, but it looks like an illness. And uh, that problem is uh, that uh, we are not satisfied. We do not live life to the full. We have a problem. They cannot define it. Uh, when John says Jesus is the only solution, it may sound like an evangelist coming to all of us saying, come to Jesus. Jesus is the only solution. It's not that cheap. Let me explain to you very briefly my very simplistic way to explain to myself, not to everybody else, to myself, how I see Jesus being the only solution to my problem. Imagine that someone, imagine that you whoever you are, are in the middle of the ocean trying to survive. Nobody around you, no plane above, no boat, nothing. You're trying to swim. The sharks are all around. You try to swim and go to a shore somewhere. You don't see it. You're right in the middle. You need to be saved. And suddenly you see a thing afloat. You know that might be your salvation. It might be. But you try now to calculate according to what you know that Archimedes told you how that thing is pushed by a force, right? What the volume of that thing is and if that thing can 
can hold your weight. You try to calculate first. So you, you are desperate in the middle of the ocean. You see this piece of wood, you know, and you try to calculate now. What is the volume? What is the pressure from underneath? How come it floats? Could it hold my weight and so on and so forth? And if you, with your mathematics, understand that this thing might hold you, then you jump on it and you, you um, accept the salvation that is being offered to you. People tell me, prove to me that Jesus is real, exists, and I will believe in him. And I always tell my friends, I cannot prove. But what I can tell you is this. Imagine you are in the middle of the ocean. You see a thing going on, like around you, afloat. Do you try to understand and prove that thing can hold you, or you will just grab it, jump on it, desperately accepting that salvation? This is how I ex explain how Jesus is my only solution, my friend. Whether we want it or not, this is the solution. We cannot prove it. We don't have time to prove it. The Bible speaks about something deeper that can be proved only when you grab it, not before. So, um, Jesus is the only solution. Um, let me talk about the two, three things today. I told you that the gospel is a solution in every period in history. It's not only a solution, it's the solution. Um, in history, we didn't have, like uh, in the first century, people did not, uh, they were not concerned with um, uh, like s uh, spending too much time o online and not being socially active in person, right? In the first century, that was not an issue, that was not a problem. They didn't have problem with gas, with traffic, with stuff like that. However, they had a very huge problem in the first century when Jesus appeared. We're talking about Christmas. People had a number one anxiety in the first century was death. People were dying. Illness, they didn't have a lot of knowledge about dealing with illness. Uh, wars, uh, tyranny, uh, life expectancy in the first century, friends, a guess. I would like a guess. Life expectancy. 30. 30 years old. Life expectancy. Number one problem in the first century, death. Uh, Jesus comes in a time when people are unsafe. Life is very short. Uh, wars and tyranny and illness and hunger and all those problems, they would threat them with the one word, death. When Jesus came in the first century, my friends, religions everywhere would offer solutions. And I'd like to give you a few solutions of the time and, and, and see how Jesus is the only one. Uh, people were coming with uh, solutions like resignation. Like in, in facing life, facing death, what can you do other than just resign? That's, that's all you can do. Socrates, the philosopher, he came with this philosoph uh, ideology and he said before his death, he said to his disciples, don't worry, don't worry, I resign, but I know my soul will live forever. My soul will escape this prison of the body and will live forever, so don't worry about death. That death is not an issue. So people came with this solution, okay. So we don't have to worry about death because our souls live forever. And then we go back to our series a couple of weeks ago about death after uh, life after death and soul and stuff like that. That's a, an answer to an anxiety, but uh, it's not necessarily the courageous answer. It's not necessarily the valid answer that was given. Uh, they said we resign, but they didn't solve the problem of death. Others, they came with uh, uh, what, what Paul calls in, uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians. Well, let's eat and drink today. That's a solution to death. You know, we know we're dying. 
Okay, so what should we do? Let's have fun. Eat, drink. Paul says it in... Um, let me read it from uh, 1 Corinthians. He actually quotes a, an Old Testament uh, passage there. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 32. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus for uh, merely human reasons, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. So people uh, did not believe in resurrection. They thought a soul is living on. And uh, Paul says, if only for that, if, if only for this I live my life, it's not worth living it. If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. So he was saying this not as a piece of advice, but he was just quoting, you know, the philosophy of the time. Another solution for death is well, enjoy as much as you can this moment. Eat, indulge, you know, just Christmas, there you go, that's the time. Indulge, tomorrow, you never know. That's another solution to the problem offered in the first uh, century. Another very interesting solution was the religious, uh, religion of Orpheus. Have you heard of that? Orpheus is a Greek uh, myth about a guy who played very nice instru uh, instruments. And uh, his wife was down underground, and uh, he went there to redeem her. And anyways, there is a myth about it. But because he, had, he played so nicely, he was uh, believed to, uh, to uh, uh, appease the wrath of, uh, of the gods and stuff like that. So uh, he developed to be a god himself because he was playing so nice. And people developed a religion based on this myth in which they believe that if they spend uh, a night in a cave and they lit some, uh, light, uh, some candles uh, and come out of the cave in the morning, that symbolizes Orpheus coming from, from uh, underworld and saving them, saving them from darkness, from death, from all the, uh, the dark uh, things of, of the time. So the religion of... Uh, of um, Orpheus, uh, Orpheus was a solution to the anxiety of people when it comes to what? Death, death. Now, all of these things in comparison with what the apostles said. You read the Gospels and you read then the letters of Paul. You, you read the history of the apostles. What is the number one proclamation they had? The, the main the main topic they would talk about? Resurrection. Resurrection. You know why? They were coming in a time when people were afraid of death. When death was number one problem of everyone. Saying, we have spent time with one who went underground and came back alive. You want that thing? what we call eternal life, have fellowship with Him. This is number one message to a people anxious and afraid of death. That's why you encounter the message of resurrection so many times in the gospel. Because they, the apostles, appealed in a relevant way in that time and day to a fear that they people, the people developed because death was number one thing. Now today, we can live longer. We have discovered medicine and, and secrets and stuff like that. Death is still a threat, but it's not number one today. In that time, people in their 20s, 30s, they were so afraid of death. The apostles would come with this message. We have touched, we looked at, we talked to, we had fellowship with the word of life. It's not Orpheus. It's not somebody else. He was dead, but came alive. He has the power of resurrection. He was resurrected. He will resurrect all of us who have had fellowship with Him. Believe in Him, and you will have life. What kind? Eternal. What kind of eternal life? Complete life. That's why you encounter in the first century the message of the gospel that that shows that Jesus is the only solution to the problems they had. 
and the problems they had mainly uh, they, uh, that was uh, death. Uh, number two, Middle Ages. What is the problem of the humanity in the Middle Ages? Guilt. You know, reading history, that in the Middle Ages, pilgrimage, uh, pl pilgrimage uh, fasting, uh, self inflicted wounds, uh, what else? All kinds of things people would do, paying, pay, paying a lot of money for what? Out of a sense of guilt. Out of a sense of guilt. And the church, the church took advantage of this. So they invented in that time a whole system in, in which people would pay, would do anything, would cut their veins, would do anything, would go, you know, would circle the world just to make sure that their guilt is being what? Forgiven, taken away. And uh, in that time, this guy called Martin Luther, 17th century, he comes with a message. You see, every message, important message in, in history comes right on time. When people were so guilty, so, so impoverished, so burdened by, by guilt, Luther comes with this message. Do not try to wash yourselves over and over again. Your hands will be dirty forever unless you believe in Jesus Christ who takes away your sin. He is the only one who can wash you. And you will be free of guilt. Stop doing all you're doing. All the works, all the, the things that you are doing to appease your conscience and God Start looking at Jesus Christ. We have forgiveness and righteousness only in Him, not in our works. So in that time, when people were so, so uh, burdened by guilt, the message of the gospel comes afresh. Led by the Holy Spirit, Luther and his colleagues, they proclaimed a freedom message. Freedom from what? From guilt, yes. They needed to hear it. He brought the message, and today we still preach that. Okay. Let me come now very quickly to the 21st century. There is a third guilt, a third uh, problem that we deal with. A barrier between us and life complete that stands between us. And, and, and um, uh, it won't let us experience what the word of life has come to give to us. What is that problem now in the 21st century? Do we still fear death? Yes, we do. That's not our main problem, though, today in the 21st century. Still having guilt, dealing with that? Yes, yes, we do. That's not our main problem in this century today. In the 21st century, if you live today, every day, if we wake up, and live on for a day and then wake up again and again and again, you would be able to tell me what our problem is in the 21st century. Too busy, someone said? Greed? These are symptoms, my friends, not, not problems. But they are symptoms of one problem that we have. Doubt, dissatisfaction, lack of meaning. Our life has no meaning. How many people today can only function if they take their drug daily? I'm not talking about uh, uh, alcohol, marijuana, uh, whatever. I'm talking about drugs. Can you read? How many people can only function today if they take their drugs? I'm not talking about what people had in the past, you know. How many people cannot live today without <laughs> drugs? My friends, uh, it may look hilarious. These are the modern addictions. 
these are the drugs of today. They are meant to be pain killers. What is the pain? Science has discovered today that the same nervous centers who are responsible with the physical pain are also responsible with the psychological pain, with the moral pain. So people who, are, who hurt physically, they have to, have to take uh, painkillers, right? But guess what? The same nervous centers are responsible with the moral pain. So people take all the drugs to kill the pain. What is the pain? Lack of meaning in life. They don't have a sense in life. Life goes nowhere. How many people have asked me in the last few days, why do we live and then die? I mean, isn't this unfair? We live, we live, we enjoy a little bit of life there, and you know, by 50, we start going down the hill and we look down instead of up, and life is not fair. I know the Bible talks about resurrection and stuff and eternal life, and, but life is not fair. That is not about life, that is about meaning. People today do not see meaning in life, do not see a sense, do not see fulfillment, do not see a point towards their, their looking with hope, with assurance, lack of meaning. All these drugs, they are meant to kill that pain. And people today use every single drug possible just to make sure that they kill a pain that they are aware of or are not aware of. But my friends, today's problem in the 21st century is not death, though that is a problem. It's not guilt, though that is a problem. It's a lack of meaning. And the, the thing is that I discover here, that Jesus Christ, according to John, the life appeared. In the 21st century, my friends, if we have to preach about Jesus Christ, then we must preach about Him being the solution to the lack of meaning in life. Of course, guilt and death, He is the solution to those too, and we should preach that too. But look on the streets today, how many people look or, or give you the impression that they have meaning in life. As they shop, as they marry on Christmas time, as they eat, as they look online, as they have thousands of friends on Facebook, how many really enjoy complete life? How many? The Bible says there is only one life that is complete, that is full of meaning, that is hopeful, that is the life meant to be given to us, and that is offered only in Jesus Christ. You want that life. Uh, uh, John says, have fellowship with Jesus Christ. Um, <clears throat> I told you many times probably a story, a little book that I recommended once. I think uh, only D asked me about the book after the sermon. I remember very sharply. Uh, by Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was a psychi psychiatrist uh, in um, Austria who was a victim of the Nazi system in Auschwitz. And uh, he speaks in this little book, Men's Search for Meaning. Something very interesting that I would like to share with you once again. Don't mind if I repeat myself, but that's uh, very useful, very, very uh, insightful. He speaks about his days in Auschwitz. Uh, how every, every um, morning they would wake up at about 4 a.m. or 3 a.m. and the guards will come and uh, beat them and punish them and send them to work and every day like that with a threat of death every single day. So he explains in the book, if you want to read it, I uh, deeply recommend it. Very little book. Uh, he speaks about the fact that, um, for example, um, he speaks about a stereotype that would happen every morning. He would wake up and every morning he would see at least one person who would, who would sit on the edge of the bed, grab a uh, cigarette, and start smoking it with a blank stare. 
you know, at 4 a.m. in the morning before the guards would come to, to force them to work. Blank stare, smoking with a, you know, a cigarette. Frankel says, I knew that in three days that person would be dead. Why? He lost meaning, hope. Life has no meaning. So he said, I can be that person unless I pretend that I am here to analyze the behavior of people when they deal with limits. He, he uh, himself being a psychiatrist. So he had to impose to himself a meaning in order to survive Auschwitz. Otherwise, that wouldn't be possible. So he discovered that as soon as he imposed to himself to play the role of the psych psychiatrist, studying the behavior of people around him, he got the energy and the, the resources to live on another day and another day and another day and another day. But however, he speaks about people every day waking up. Waking up with a cigar, cigarette, with a blank stare, looking nowhere and losing hope of life, meaning in life, the hope that Auschwitz will not be forever and may, they may survive and have a life again. So uh, he would say, that's what, uh, what uh, helped me to survive Auschwitz. I found a meaning in that ordeal that I had to go through. But he says something interesting. That's not the most interesting thing that he says. He speaks about the fact that he survived Auschwitz. He got back to work in the great cities of uh, Europe. He traveled everywhere. And he speaks about the fact that walking on the streets of, uh, uh, of uh, the big cities, he would encounter teenagers on the streets with a cigarette, blank stare, looking nowhere. And he would conclude, it is the same illness in Auschwitz. People free, free, everything at hand. Their phones, their computers, their drugs everywhere, their cars, everything in life. Freedom, freedom all over. And yet, walking on the streets, blank stare, smoking, looking nowhere, no hope of a future, no meaning in life. Life has no meaning. When John says, the life appeared, he's talking about Jesus Christ coming. In every epoch in history, he gave the solution to the problem. In the first century, he gave the solution to death. And he said, I am the resurrection and the life. In the Middle Ages, he came and said, I can wash you. In the 21st century, my friends, <clears throat> whether you accept it or not, we live on thinking that we have found the secret of life. But search deeply and you'll find that the lack of meaning is our, is our number one problem. And Jesus comes. In a season of Christmas, of course, we speak about His coming. I would like to tell you today, He's not coming as a baby anymore, like I said last night. He grew up, and grew up being not only a person, a model, but the one who holds the solution to our life. He comes with no painkillers, with nothing like that. He just comes with a very, very deep invitation. Come have fellowship. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life. The apostles couldn't prove. They couldn't demonstrate. They could only say, you are lost in the middle of the ocean. Grab this. This is your only solution. 
We have touched it. I'm not talking about demonstration. I'm talking about I have experienced it. He is the solution to your problem. Grab it. And once you grab it, you will become one who will consider death again. You will consider the sin being a problem resolved. Why? He takes care of that every day. Every day when you fall on your knees, when you pray, when you talk to Him, and you confess your sin, you know He has taken care of the problem. You're free of guilt. You are dirty, but you look so nice because He covered you. So that's not a problem anymore. And number three, lack of meaning? Grab Jesus Christ. Get to know Him. And I cannot prove to you I cannot demonstrate. It's only something that I can testify because of what I observed in my life. That once you accept Him, once you understand why He exists, why He is God, why this universe is, is His creation, why he, he designed a plan in which you are the center, His focus. Once you understand all of these, just grabbing this book that is not old, is so relevant in every time, every period of history. Once you understand who Jesus Christ is, something will happen. I cannot describe to you what that something is. Something will happen inside. Something that you will not be able to explain. Only tell others, I have touched it. I have seen it. I have felt it. I know about it. You want to come out of the problem, have fellowship with Him. And my friends, if we preach about Christmas, then in the 21st century today, we should preach that Jesus Christ is the solution to the lack of meaning simply because He was and is the solution to death, the solution to guilt, and the solution to our problems today. So for me, this is Christmas. I would say, be merry, be happy. We still have a chance to get in touch with Him. Merry Christmas to all of you.